Welcome to Lethal Dose, your favorite toxicology-focused podcast where we delve into true crime cases involving drugs and poisons. My name is Venus Dineko. I'm a layperson fascinated by true crime. My name is Kayla Woods. I'm an author and toxicologist. Let's get started. who Graham Young or the teacup poisoner or the St. Albans poisoner are? I do not. That's exciting. That's exciting. I am excited. Okay. I should say before we dive into it that there is a content warning for Nazism and anti-Semitism because this guy's a piece of shit. Okay. And also a little bit of suicidal ideation later on and institutionalization. All right. So Graham Frederick Young is our subject today. Listeners may also have heard of him as the teacup poisoner or the St. Albans poisoner, as I mentioned before. And there was a movie made about him based actually on my main source called The Young Poisoner's Handbook. And that is not the same as The Poisoner's Handbook, which is a movie based off of a Deborah Blum book of the same name. So Gotcha. Not to be confused. Things. Not to be confused. Yeah, but they may have heard about him this way. That's actually how I heard about him, is I think I was probably looking for the Poisoner's Handbook documentary and found the Young Poisoner's Handbook Mm. movie, and that was a couple years ago. But uh, Graham, he was born in September, September 7th, 1947, in North London, and he did come from a bit of a broken home. Not that that's any excuse, of course. But his mother died shortly after giving birth to him, and it's speculated that his father blamed him for it. Oh. As um, sometimes happens, you know? Sure. I mean, I get that that happens, but it's also like they were a fetus slash newborn, kind of hard to put all of that on them. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And then, like, he had a kind of a weird childhood because his, like, family system was broken. And, like, he went to live with his aunt for a while when he was really young. So that was, like, his first maternal figure. And then, like, his dad got his shit back together and married a new woman and then was like, I can take the kids again because he had an older sister. So his dad took the kids back. So his mom died. He was ripped away from his first mom, and then he went to live with his stepmom. So everything was just kind of weird. And then, you know, there was, like, he related to books more than people and had a hard time relating to kids his age. But it's, like, a lot of kids are like that. Like that's That describes a lot of people. Yeah. There's a lot of speculation for why he ended up the way he did, and I just don't know that I'm at all interested in any of that. But the main book I read really wanted to like paint him as a psychopath and I don't even know how I feel about the use of that word like Mm. they're like oh it's obvious because he was into toxicology and chemistry and the occult and it's like (laughs) you're like hey this is me same yeah (laughs) there was a lot of stuff where I was like hey don't don't put me in the same category as this asshole we Mm. are different (laughs) but he was just he was an edgelord he was an edgelord kid a lot like jim jones he was obsessed with the nazis i'm not going to play armchair psychologist or anything like that and i don't want to draw a parallel between him and jim jones and be like look how scary these two are but like edgelord assholes from a young Mm -hmm. age is kind of what you can say and then you know graham young ended up being into chemistry so he really like took that road with it and it ended up not being good When he was 13, he was living with his dad, his sister, and his stepmother, and he hated this stepmother. And his father gave him a weekly allowance of two shilling and six pence, and then he mopped the floor at a local cafe for another five shilling a week. So basically, he was making about 41 cents a week, or about nine pounds in today's money, which is just under $11 in today's money, like doing all of the various... All of these, yeah, (laughs) nice math, thank you. Thank you. But in April of 1961, he started to use this money, and for the first time, he bought antimony at a chemist shop with his allowance. Now, it was illegal to sell to someone under 17, but they weren't exactly checking IDs back then. And Young had such an extensive understanding of antimony and its uses, he actually said he was going to use it for experiments. And so the chemist believed he was just small for his age. He believed he was just talking mm. to a small 17-year-old who knew a lot about antimony. And then there was the poison register, which we've brought up before. So 
He did sign the poison's register, but he signed it with the false name M.E. Evans and then gave a fake address. And the first time he bought antimony, he bought 25 grams and then began making a small stockpile in his bedroom. What is antimony? And is that a lot? Yes, I would say 25 grams of antimony is quite a bit. Antimony is a semi-metal, it's a pure element, and in the 1960s, chemist shops were carrying antimony primarily for the treatment of parasitic diseases like gotcha. schistomyasis and malaria, okay. and these had been common treatments for this since about 1918. Okay. It's also possible that they were keeping it on hand for different laboratory uses. Like I know at this time they were making plastics and flame retardants with antimony, but I don't know that that's what chemists' shops were carrying it for. Um, Mm. So it was probably the anti-parasite use. And I mean, London's not a tropical location, but it was probably, you know, not often used. But like if you return from somewhere tropical, your physician would be able to pick it up. But it was known to induce toxicity that resulted in nausea and vomiting and could lead to fatal arrhythmias. And so, kind of a weird, obscure poison, because London's not tropical, whatever, but Graham had all of these books on chemistry and toxicology, Nazis and murderers and stuff. And so he chose antimony because one of his favorite books on poisons discussed antimonies used by poisoners, including... Edward William Pritchard and Charles Bravo. Mm. And Pritchard was a doctor who killed his wife with antimony in 1865. And at this time, before the antiparasite use, antimony was used therapeutically for purging sickness from the body by exploiting the toxicity of antimony. Solutions of antimony could be used to induce emesis, although some families actually had heirloom antimony pills called perpetual pills, which could be taken, used to induce vomiting or diarrhea, and then fished out of the chamber pot after the purge, cleaned off, and then placed back in the medicine cabinet for anybody else to use. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) Victorian era medicine, everybody. (laughs) Yep. Gotta love it. So Edward Pritchard specifically was able to murder his wife slowly over three months and made it look like an ongoing sickness this Mm. way. From this story, Graham Young was able to learn that antimony is a slow-acting poison that could easily fly under the radar if administered chronically at low doses to make it appear like a natural sickness. It is said that even at his young age, Graham was interested in the mechanism of toxicity of poisons, and so he probably also knew the antimony present in antimony potassium tartrate, which is always how... He referred to it. He was one of those, like, deeply arrogant, unpleasant people that wouldn't just call it antimony, but it's antimony potassium tartrate specifically. (laughs) I know things about things, and I'd like you to know that. Exactly. (laughs) So he probably knew that that was the inorganic form of antimony, antimony with a plus three charge, and that was more toxic than the organic form of antimony, which is antimony with a plus four charge. Okay. And although very little antimony is absorbed in the GI tract, when the inorganic form enters the body, it attacks red blood cells and glutathione, which leaves cells susceptible to oxidative stress and free radicals in the body, causing cell damage, especially in the myocardium surrounding the heart. And it prevents the body from using sugar and fats, which are both essential for keeping this thing running. Antimony is an irritant to both the GI tract and the skin, hence the purgative properties, and it can also result in ulcers. It acts slowly upon the body and is excreted rapidly in urine, but chronic exposure to antimony can cause a buildup of the metal in the body. In 2010, it was estimated by one group that the daily exposure of antimony to the general public is around 5 micrograms a day, but amounts as low as 0.5 milligrams per kilogram body weight can induce emesis. So... It doesn't take a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Graham would carry a vial of this poison around with him and show it off at school. And his friends didn't think anything of it because they were also kids, but they were the same kinds of kids who thought it was funny when he did impressions of Hitler. Mm. And one of these friends was a boy named Chris Williams. And Chris wasn't super close to Graham. He actually was, you know, moseying about hanging out with different groups of boys and ended up spending more time with another boy named Terry Hans. 
Graham got jealous of this and challenged Terry to a fight, which Graham lost. And while he was laying on the ground, Chris walked up over to where Graham was laying and then stood over him and just kind of looked down, like, how does that feel? And according to Chris, Graham looked back up at him and said, I'll kill you for that. Like, okay. I'll kill you because I got in a fight because I like you and then I lost. And yeah. now you have to die. <laughs> and now you have must die. Yeah. So the next Monday following this fight... Chris was violently ill during class in the afternoon and had to go home. The following Monday, the same thing happened despite a recovery during the week. So it didn't seem like it was the same thing, but it's like, ah, oh, man, this week is, it's happening again. You know, it seems like the same thing. But Chris realized that before both episodes of sickness, he'd skipped school with Graham and eaten lunch with him and sandwiches for the lunch had been provided by Graham. Bum, bum, bum. But Chris was a kid, and so his deductive reasoning pretty much ended there. Like, oh. Oh, both times I've gotten sick hanging out with Graham. Weird. Weird. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He didn't approach Graham about it. He didn't ask Graham, like, hey, did you feel all right after eating lunch? Right. And he knew Graham was into poisons, but he didn't, like, Put two and two together, put two and, together yeah. and like ask him about it, which I kind of get because even if you're friends with someone who likes poisons and you feel <laughs> sick, you don't necessarily blame that jump friend. To, you don't jump to conclude and think like, oh, my friend who's into poisons is trying to hurt me. But this person also said, I'll kill you for that. So true. There's there's a small difference there. A little bit, yes. I have never <clears throat> threatened your life in any way. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Chris kept hanging out with Graham and was sick pretty regularly for the rest of the year. And what would have made it more difficult to, for Chris to reason through what was happening was that Graham was manipulating him in other ways and playing off of the illnesses. So, for instance, one day, Graham and Chris went to the London Zoo together. And this was just as Chris was coming, like, out of about of this mystery illness. Graham knew this. He knew that he was sick and had been feeling better. And Graham told Chris that he felt bad for him. And so he offered him some homemade lemonade that he'd fixed up specifically to make Chris feel better. But on the way back home from the zoo, Chris was violently ill again and had to spend the next few days in bed with stomach pains. Mm. And obviously, Chris's parents were aware of how frequently he was sick, and they were worried that there was something, like, seriously wrong with him, or he was acting out for attention. So at Chris's GP, they explained that Chris always had the same symptoms. He experienced violent vomiting, chest pains, stomach pains, headaches, cramping in his limbs, but the doctor couldn't find anything wrong with him, so he referred him to the Wilsden Hospital, where he was diagnosed with migraine headaches, but they also suggested that he see a psychiatrist. Oh, no. Maybe it's all in his head. His head, yeah. And his parents refused to do this. Like, maybe good on them for not elevating it to that level? I don't know. Sure. But he also but, and just so didn't... they didn't suspect the friend at all? No, they didn't suspect Graham. I don't know that they knew Graham, but they didn't... But they didn't have any reason to... They suspect... didn't have any reason to suspect he was being poisoned. <laughs> right. Is the thing. But it, it just meant he didn't get any help at all. It was around this time that Molly Young, Graham's stepmother, found some of his antimony in his room and told Graham's father about it. There was a huge family blow-up, and Molly confronted the chemist at the shop that Graham had been buying it from and told him not to sell to Graham anymore. Like, hey, this kid is 13. He's my stepson. Don't sell to him. But it didn't stop Graham. He just started shopping at a different shop. And, you know, you kind of think his parents might have considered that, but they really just hit the one shop and were like, don't sell to my kid. Right. And then that was the end of it. Problem solved. Yeah, they weren't like, oh, maybe he'll <laughs> take this to other shops. I guess they thought that their, like, parenting was effective enough that he'd be like, oh, I do feel bad for buying poison. Right. <laughs> and then they they raised his allowance. And so now he has more money to go out and okay. buy more poison with. <laughs> And he was signing with the same name, the same address. He literally changed nothing except the shop he was going to. It's hard to say what Graham was thinking after this. It could be that Graham now saw Molly with a target on her back from trying to stop him. But he also already hated Molly. So maybe he was just like, I'll just 
fuck around with Molly. See how this goes. Mm -hmm. Any normal person would think it was not a good idea to poison someone when they just discovered that you were secretly stashing poison away, I would think. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. Like, things might be a little bit conspicuous. Right. But, like all of the antagonists on our show, Graham Young was both a bumbler and an edgelord. And so he was like, oh, Molly knows I have poisons. Molly's going to be the next one to get it. So Molly was sick twice in the winter of 1961. Both times she experienced headache, stomach ache, and constipation. And so she thought she was having bilious attacks. And this is basically just indigestion with migraine headaches. And they're thought to be brought on by, like, eating or drinking too much because it impacts the liver. So it's that bile and, like, kind of those leftover humors type diagnoses that we used Mm -hmm. to give ourselves. Fred Young, Graham's father, he was also sick a couple of times. Graham's sister, Winifred, only got sick once. She was out with her boyfriend a lot that winter and not usually home for meals. But she was violently ill after a rare meal with the family on one occasion. And after Winifred got sick, the family started to wonder, only at this point, if maybe (laughs) they all had something that was going around or maybe there was something Mm. more worrisome, like... Oh, no, was Graham using their dishes for his chemical experiments that they knew he conducted in the house, even though he wasn't supposed to, and then not washing them out properly? I love the naivety. (laughs) I just, I love that, like, all of the stuff in the background is going on, and it's like, are you not going to do anything about that on top of that thing? going to the chemist (laughs) shop? Like, yeah, there's a lot happening in this (laughs) household. (laughs) Fred didn't think that it was possible that Graham was hurting them in any way, like intentionally or accidentally, because he'd told Graham not to do the experiments in the house. (laughs) So there's no way that he would disobey him. No way. Absolutely not. I mean, I've already told him no. Children. Told him don't do this. Never disobey. Of course he he listened. (laughs) We told him not to go to the chemist shop. He's not going there anymore. Of course he listened. My word is law. (laughs) Graham also wasn't spared the sickness. Graham was occasionally sick as well. And so I guess his father was like, well, if it was Graham making himself sick or making us sick, like, it's weird. Like, I don't think he would do that because he went to his aunt's house and had tea with her and then ended up getting violently ill on her porch. Like, who would... Who would do that to themselves. To That's themselves, weird. right. So I don't think that it's Graham doing it accidentally and certainly not intentionally. I don't think he had any thoughts that Graham was potentially as malicious to, like, poison them intentionally. So Aunt Winnie was actually the first to suspect that something other than just a bug was making the family sick. And she thought Graham might be responsible. And this is the same aunt that had raised him when he was really young. Okay. So he gotcha. really liked Aunt Winnie. She somehow was able to be like, I don't, something is going on that is weird with Graham. So she told her husband about her suspicions. And although he didn't agree, she told her daughter not to even have a cup of tea while visiting her cousin's house. Like, oh. that, that is was how, that level. Yeah. That's how concerned she was. And honestly, it was wise because he was poisoning the food, the tea, and the coffee with antimony. So it wasn't accidentally ending up in the dishes by any means. He was putting it in these things. Right. And Molly's condition became worse, and she tried to hide it from Fred and Winifred so that they wouldn't worry about her or, like, cause some sort of ruckus over whether or not Graham was responsible. Because I think Aunt Winnie maybe did say something to Fred. So there might have been a little bit of, like, I think, and, like, Fred being like, no, that's not possible. But Molly was just like, I don't want there to be anything going on. I feel like shit. I don't think it's Graham. So why doesn't everybody just shut up and try to, like, deal with me being sick? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. As far as Fred knew, his son was actually very doting on his stepmother whenever she was ill. And he would always run to the chemist for a prescription when she needed it. So same thing he was doing with his friend Chris, where it's like, oh, you feel so bad. Let me help you. Well, let me take care of you. Yeah. Yeah. After Graham turned 14 in the summer of 1961, poisoning his family became an obsession and he strengthens his efforts against them. Graham's sister Winifred became sick at work one day in November after drinking tea Molly made for her that morning. A co-worker took her to the hospital where she was diagnosed with belladonna poisoning. 
And we've talked a bit about Belladonna, but I don't remember if we've talked about it on the main channel or not. I don't believe so. Yeah, Belladonna poisoning, it just, like, causes headaches, it can cause amesis, and it especially causes dilation of the pupils. Makes your pupils look huge. Mm. <laughs> and that's why it's called Belladonna, beautiful woman, which apparently having huge pupils and like, right. a forehead that never ends because this is 13th <laughs> century Italy. Right. It was very attractive. <laughs> So anyhow, she gets diagnosed with belladonna poisoning. That evening, Winifred directly accused Graham of being careless with his chemicals. She, again, thinks he's doing some experiments with the family dishes. And she's like, you were careless. You got me sick. And he ran into his room and cried so much that Winifred actually ended up apologizing to him that oh, night. Oh, God. Yeah. But, of course, Graham really had poisoned his sister with belladonna-containing atropine, which he was hoarding in his room along with antimony, digitalis, aconite, and thallium. And Graham was able to purchase thallium from the chemist, of course. This is where he was getting everything. Because thallium was a heavy metal more toxic than mercury or lead, and in the 1960s, it was still being used as an insecticide and pesticide against squirrels and rats. Although, soon after all of this, in the 1970s, I think, it would be banned in the United States because of the accidental poisoning that would result from the household mm. use of thallium by regular people. Even touching thallium can result in a fatal exposure. Because oh, wow. it, we actually absorb it through our skin quite easily. So, like antimony, exposure to thallium inhibits glutathione activity, allowing for the formation of free radical species and damage to cells. Thallium is also similar enough to potassium to be taken up through the body's potassium channels and to inhibit the body's use of glucose, interfere with muscle contraction, and induce cellular apoptosis, which is cell death. Mm-hmm. The estimated lethal dose of thallium in adults is 8 to 10 milligrams per kilogram, so that's around 220 milligrams for a 150-pound adult as an acute dose. That's not a lot at all. That's, no, it's not a ton. And it was thallium, not antimony, which dealt the final blow to Molly Young. On Easter, April 21st, 1962, Molly was feeling particularly badly. For months, she had had back aches and headaches that she was trying to push through and just live a normal life. And because it was so normal, Fred went about his life normally as well. He went out to lunch at a pub, and when he returned, Graham was sitting at a window in the back of the house, watching Molly writhing in pain out in the backyard. Fred took Molly to Wilsden Hospital, where she was admitted for overnight observation, but overall seemed to be doing pretty okay. And this wasn't even the first time she'd been admitted to the hospital for observation since she'd started to get sick. So it was mm -hmm. just another, another one of those things that she had to deal with now. Right. Yeah. She sent Fred back home to get her an overnight bag, and while he was gone, she died. Well, that escalated quickly. It did. Molly Young was only 38 and had been sick for months, but there was no real explanation for what caused her death. The autopsy revealed that a bone at the top of her spinal column collapsed, to which her cause of death was attributed. Molly had been in a car accident in the summer of 1961 where her seat had loosened and she'd been thrown at the ceiling and hit her head. She'd been in a lot of pain since then, and the family thought it was possible that maybe it was related to the untreated injuries from the accident. So they didn't really have it investigated any further. Once they saw that that bone collapsed, they were like, oh, okay, it was just the car accident. It was untimely and sudden, but at least there's an explanation for it, you know? Mm -hmm. At Graham's insistence, Molly was cremated on April 26th. The wake was held in the Young's home with food prepared by the family. After eating one of the ham sandwiches with some mustard pickles that had been prepared by the family, Molly's brother-in-law, Uncle John, became violently ill. And I don't know if anyone suspected anything because nobody said anything. Mm. But I don't know. <laughs> Maybe it's we just should another all... one of those things. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> 
And Fred had actually been feeling better in the last couple of weeks, ironically, since Molly had been feeling worse and worse before she died. Only a few days after her death, he had another one of the attacks that he had been having regular occurrences of before his wife died. This was stomach pain, vomiting, and diarrhea. He was sick for days, which wasn't like things had been before where he'd normally get sick on a Monday and then feel better as the week progressed. This was, like, con continuing way longer. Mm-hmm. Winifred was also concerned about how long he'd been ill and convinced him to go to his GP. And the GP suggested that Fred check himself into the hospital, but Fred refused. Because he's a man of uh, the times and probably <laughs> doesn't want to get help, of course. But as he was leaving the GP's office, he collapsed and was taken by ambulance to the same hospital where his wife died only two weeks before. Oh, wow. So he got his hand was forced a little bit there. A little bit. Hospital staff were able to stabilize his condition, but he had to stay for a while in their care. And it could be said that he'd started looking at things differently since molly's death maybe or maybe the whispers in the family you know aunt winnie and all that had gotten to him because he wasn't standing up for graham anymore he always said that his son couldn't possibly poison his own family but now he was seeing a different pattern for instance for himself every time he'd been sick previously before molly died it was on a monday after he'd spent his Sundays eating lunch with his son at the pub. This is when Graham could have poisoned his drink, because because Graham was so young, they couldn't actually eat in the pub. They had to eat outside. And so mm. when he'd go to the restroom inside, he was all the way in the building, and Graham would be alone with his drink. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. And the last... And do we know, is there a taste to thallium and antimony in these things or is it just slightly metallic like i would think it's slightly metallic so okay. whatever they say about like arsenic and things like that it's right. probably like that but i don't know i think it's really hard to say i think it's fairly tasteless especially if it's in something bitter gotcha so if it's in a beer like you probably right. can't really tell right this last time he'd gotten sick was after spending a dinner with Graham and was also after having informed Graham and Winifred that the house was paid off and would be theirs after his death because it wasn't going to be able to go to Molly anymore. Mm. In the hospital, Fred didn't want Graham to come anywhere near him, but he couldn't avoid him and his poisons at home. Two days after Fred's release from the hospital, his condition worsened and he had to go back. It was only at this point that tests were run to determine if Fred was being poisoned, and they announced to the entire family, <laughs> everyone's present, it was either antimony or arsenic. But Graham didn't really seem to process what this meant, because when everybody turned around and was like, oh shit... He was busy explaining to the doctors how they could make the distinction if it was antimony or arsenic through specific tests that oh he was Oh, my God. Of. Yeah. Arrogant to the fucking max. Yeah. The next day, they confirmed that it was antimony, and they told Fred Young that a single dose more would have killed him. He eventually would recover, mostly, but he would have permanent liver damage as a result of this. The word got out quickly in the community, and it was more than just Graham's aunt who thought that he'd poisoned his father and his stepmother. Like, I think it's pretty clear that he's poisoned them. It's like one of these things is not like the other. One of these <laughs> people likes all of the things like, that would lead them to believe that it's you. Right. But they haven't proven that it's him. So everybody no. in the community knows that it's him, but he's still just out and about being like, I'm just a kid. I don't know what you're talking about. Right. So, now, Mr. Doctor, please try to use more specific tests next time. Thanks. Right. Yeah. And his science teacher at school actually was one of the people who was like, this is suspicious. Because <laughs> he had seen Graham come in after hours and conduct experiments with poisons. And he knew that he had a like a specific notebook that he was constantly writing in when he would come in after hours. So he decided to search Graham's desk and found several bottles of poison in his desk at school, and he found the notebook. He took all of the evidence to the headmaster, and then both of them approached Fred Young's GP. Like, I'm guessing it's kind of a small community if they were able to, like, figure out who that guy right. was. But... Right, sure. But then, 
all of these men collectively decided against going to the police just yet. Oh, no. Because they thought it would be better if maybe Graham was referred to a child psychiatrist. Graham was told that this psychiatrist was actually a representative of the career services offices, who was going to help him with his studies and his goals for getting into a university. So that's how they got him to talk to him. So he talked to the psychiatrist very willingly. And this psychiatrist took everything Graham told him, and he was he was showing off because he was like, oh, this, like, knowledge. He thinks, he's a, he thinks that he's talking to somebody that might help him get a job down the road yeah, or, or get, get him into, into this uni- university. Yeah, so he's Not that he's off. going to show his culpability <laughs> in poisoning <laughs> His family. Right. Yeah. He's still a <laughs> child. He isn't making like upper level thinking decisions and all that. So he's just like showing off about his extensive knowledge of poisons. And this psychiatrist hears all that and he decides, yeah, we need to take this to the police. So the police come, they search Graham's room, they found his poisons, and then they arrested him. And when he was arrested, he essentially had just come from school. They searched his room while he was out. He came home from school and he smelt of ether somehow just having come from school and he had a Mm -hmm. vial of antimony with him and he had two full bottles of thallium so he could not have had he could have not looked more suspicious suspicious (laughs) at all yeah yeah like talk about being caught (laughs) red-handed yeah after a little bit just a little bit of pressure from the police graham confessed to almost everything He was charged with poisoning Chris Williams, Fred Young, and Winifred Young, and additional searches of the Young property turned up more stashes of poisons in the bushes. So he didn't just have them in his room, he was hiding them in the bushes. (laughs) Graham was taken to Ashford Remand Center and given a psychiatric evaluation, during which he told them, I miss my antimony, I miss the power it gives me. Not a good look. Young Graham, not yeah. a good look. Yeah, fucking edge so, lord. so did they not? Was he not charged anything with Molly because they thought it was like injuries from her car accident? Yeah, they had gotcha. no idea that she was poisoned. Young was tried at the Old Bailey on July sixth, nineteen sixty two, and pled guilty to all three charges, all three of those poisonings, not Molly's. He then gave this statement in court. I have been interested in poisons, their properties and effects since I was about 11. I tried out one of them on my friend Williams. I gave him two or three grains at school, probably on a cream biscuit or cake. He was sick after taking it. Later, I gave him other doses, always on food. After that, I started experimenting at home by putting sometimes one and sometimes three grains of poison on prepared foods which my mother, father, and sister would eat. I must have eaten some of the poisons myself occasionally because I became sick as well. On occasions, I have also put antimony tartrate solution and powder on foods at home of which my mother and father have taken. My mother lost weight all the time through it, and I stopped giving it to her about February of this year. After my mother died on the 21st of April of this year, I started putting poisons at home in the milk and water on food. As a result, my father became ill and was taken to the hospital. I then realized how ill he was. I cannot think of anyone else I have given poison to. I knew that the doses I was giving were not fatal, but I knew I was doing wrong. I knew this all along, but I could not stop it. Can't think of anyone else I've given poison to. Just can't recall. I don't think so, though. Just, I don't think so. <laughs> but my bad. <laughs> my bad. But he doesn't even he doesn't even say my bad. He says like I know it was bad and I kept doing it. His lawyer convinced him that he should confess and then write this statement because he thought it would work out better for him if he confessed. Mm. So Graham didn't want to do this and I think it kind of comes across. So despite this confession, the prosecutor argued that Molly's death could not be attributed to poisoning by Graham because her cause of death was determined already to be natural causes, and she'd been cremated. Like, there's no going back and testing any of that. The doctors from Ashford disagreed. One of them recommended that Young be institutionalized in Broadmoor, a maximum security hospital, because he felt that it was extremely likely that Graham would use poisons to exert power over people again, possibly to the extent of murder. 
It was determined that Graham was a danger to others and was obsessed with poisons. He was sent to Broadmoor Hospital for a minimum of 15 years, meaning he could not expect to be released until he was 29 years old. And at this point, I think it's a good time to talk about rehabilitation and the absolute lack thereof when we institutionalize people that we deem dangerous, especially children and people we consider psychopaths, because that just really seems like writing people off sometimes, you know? Mm -hmm. And the condition at Broadmoor were not good. It was originally opened in 1863, and it was meant to house 450 patients. But at its height, it was home to 750 people. Holy shit. Yeah. A 1968 inquiry showed that exactly when patients like Graham were there, overcrowding was still rampant to the point that a day room and dining room were being used as overflow sleeping areas. During this inquiry, a senior charge nurse was even quoted as saying, We really do not do much more for the patients than a farmer would for his animals. We are attending to their basic bodily needs. We are maintaining observation and discipline, but we are certainly not doing the job that the hospital should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. And it should go without saying that all people are deserving of respect, whatever the terms of their institutionalization. But it's also worth pointing out that not everyone in Broadmoor was a criminal like Young. Some of them were admitted because they were suffering from very serious psychiatric conditions with more violent behavior patterns that, like, got them put in there, you know, and transferred from other mental hospitals. But they weren't getting the help that they needed for those conditions. And they weren't in the appropriate state of mind that people like Young were to be able to advocate Mm, for themselves. mm -hmm. So they were just in these terrible conditions with no real way of getting out of them. Critics of Broadmoor were also concerned that patients who were considered too violent for the hospital were sometimes sent to prison, which meant that sometimes they were being sent back to a prison which had chosen to hospitalize them. It's just You know, the back and forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And other times patients were discharged sooner than the community felt was appropriate simply because the hospital needed to lighten their own load. Well, yeah, when you've got people sleeping in the dining hall, you can only stack people so high before (laughs) you have to make a cut and say, yeah, they're well enough to go. Right. Well, and if you have people who are at the bottom that it's like, well, they're not the most dangerous we have. I think it's okay. Like, there might be some people who are still like, I don't know that I agree with that. I think they still need to be getting help that they're not getting and they're not going to do well just out in the community. Mm -hmm. Within Graham's first month at Broadmoor, another patient died unexpectedly from cyanide poisoning. More unexpected because there was no cyanide anywhere on the campus. It's not like they were using it in the infirmary or anything. An investigation pointed out that the hospital grounds were lined by bushes shared by farmland, which were covered with laurels, from which cyanide could be somewhat easily extracted. Mm. Graham was never convicted of this patient's death, but there were obviously suspicions. Sure. And he didn't do anything to allay such thinking because he doubled down on his edgelord Nazi obsession and talked incessantly about poisons until he was sedated pretty much to the point of not talking at all. (laughs) At this point, of course, he'd become a somewhat model patient, somewhat because he was still pushing Nazism and he wasn't turning over a new leaf or anything. But the nurses were becoming more lenient with their treatment of him. They even allowed him to be in charge of the nurse's kitchen until one day when their coffee tasted funny and they realized it had been brewed with the bleach containing cleaner Harpic. Oh my god, like they give him they give him an inch. Yeah. <laughs> and he takes a bleach ridden mile. <laughs> Young made his first appeal for release from Broadmoor in 1966, but his hopes for release were completely dashed when his father told the tribunal that Graham should, quote, never be released again (laughs) and would never have a home with any family member should release be granted. Unsurprisingly, Graham was not granted release at this point. A few months later, a packet of sugar soap, which is powdered sodium hydroxide used for cleaning porcelain, and I guess it has the granular texture of sugar, Mm. it was found to be missing. But somebody, like, quickly noticed and reported that it was missing. So luckily, no one was served any tea from the tea trolley where the entire packet was found and had been poured into the teapot. 
That could have caused some serious gastrointestinal damage. Although the Harpic incident and really the sugar soap incident as well couldn't be proven to be Graham's work, hospital officials figured they knew who it was. The latter incident got him relocated to the hospital's ward for the most violent offenders for two years until good behavior got him relocated to a less restricted ward. By now, Graham was 23 and had been institutionalized without any real care for his mental health for eight formative years of his life. But his progress even convinced his sister to allow him to come stay with her in a preliminary step towards reintegrating Graham into society. She still had her hesitations, especially since she had a baby now, but Graham's doctors assured her that she had nothing to worry about by bringing her brother into her home. Mm. And so, Graham left Broadmoor on November 21st, 1970, and stayed with his extended family for a week. It went well, much to everyone's surprise, including my own. And <laughs> Graham was invited to stay with his sister for another week at Christmas time. While he was out, Graham took to heavy drinking with his brother-in-law, Dennis, which probably also didn't help his mental state. Sure. And then returning to the hospital after spending holidays outside of it for the first time in eight years made him both sad and angry at his lost time. So after he returned to the hospital, he told the nurse, quote, When I get out, I'm going to kill one person for every year I've spent in this place. Yikes. Yeah. And you'd think that a statement like this would have gone into a file of some sort on Young, but this was 1971, and it's not like there was a computer system that all of that information was entered into. He'd been shuffled from one doctor to another during his stay, and the current doctor he was seeing, who was the one who had reassured Winifred that Graham was reformed, was named Dr. Udwin, and this was not the same doctor who had first assessed and treated Graham upon his admission in 1962. So he essentially had two files, possibly more. And Udwin's file was already being pushed through the home security's office responsible for discharging patients. He wanted to get Graham out of there. Udwin believed he was ready to go, and there wasn't much that could be done with it by 1971 to reverse that decision. The nursing file, on the other hand, contained Young's comment on his intent to kill again, and it never left the chief nurse's office for some reason. One of the nurses who compiled this file was quoted as having said, He made no secret of the fact that he intended to poison again. Indeed, he enjoyed boasting about his ambition to go down in history as the most famous poisoner since Crippen. Who didn't even actually poison anyone. Right. <laughs> <laughs> It was also pointed out on multiple occasions that Graham was still obsessed with Hitler and the Nazis, and I think at this point it's probably safe to say that he was not just doing it to be contrarian anymore. Like, I still think that was an element of it, but after playing the part for so long, mm -hmm. I, I think that it was something he genuinely believed. And maybe he did as a kid, too, but I'm willing to, like, see a shithead kid and be like, you can change. Stop being a shithead. Like, Nazism isn't cool. But, like, when you're, like, 23 years old, it's like, no, I don't know. I think you're just a dickhead. That's just a part of you now. Yeah. Yeah. You're just a full-on Nazi-supporting anti-Semite and, like... Fuck you. And his dedication to hatred was part of the reason that the nurses and other doctors knew he had absolutely not changed whatsoever during his stay mm. at Broadmoor. But despite all of this, on February 4th, 1971, 23-year-old Graham Young was released from Broadmoor under three conditions. He had to stay at a permanent address, he had to check in with a probation supervisor, and he had to regularly attend a psych clinic. None of Graham's victims were informed of his release. His father had no idea he'd been released, and Winifred had known that he was going to be released, but hadn't realized that he had been until he showed up at her house. You know. <laughs> mm -hmm. He only stayed with his family for a few days before checking in at the Slough Training Center and beginning his highly supervised job and life in a hostel. During his first week working in the center, Young made friends with another trainee, 34-year-old amateur soccer player Trevor Sparks. The two went back to Young's hostel room after work and drank wine together and talked. 
and Sparks told Young that he'd experienced sharp stomach pains that week while playing soccer and that his doctor couldn't find anything wrong with him. But it got so bad that one afternoon he vomited twice. The evening Sparks confided this to Young, Graham handed him a glass of wine and said, this might help. I believe that it it did not help, did it? It did not. It did not help, no. It didn't help, no. Sparks was violently ill for the next four days with vomiting and diarrhea and also experienced aches in his scrotum, which sounds deeply unpleasant. <laughs> his face swelled up and he was taken to the training center's sick bay where he stayed for four days and was treated with milk of magnesia. So basically they were just like, let's just shit out whatever is inside right. of you. Eventually, the gastrointestinal stress ceased. But he experienced loss of control of his legs so extreme that he was unable to ever play soccer again. Oh, my God. I know. I know. On April 8th, six weeks after this first major bout of sickness, Sparks returned to his doctor with the same symptoms and was diagnosed with a urinary infection. True to his past form, Young was by his friend's side during his illness to offer condolences and treatments. On April 30th, Sparks had an interview that he was nervous about, and Young gave him something which he told him was bromide for nerves. Sparks took it and was once again violently ill. Sparks' doctor couldn't figure out what was wrong with him and why he kept getting sick. Eventually, he had to leave the training center and return to his hometown. There, he went to Queen Elizabeth Hospital for a more in-depth examination on June 11th, and the pains he was experiencing were attributed to some sort of strain, some sort of muscular strain, for which he was given an injection of painkillers. After that didn't help, he was diagnosed with muscle, muscle issues. Even in December, long after Young no longer had access to him, Sparks was experiencing pain but had no clues as to why. It was only then that blood and urine samples were drawn for analysis, but there was nothing abnormal in his samples at that point. Around the same time Sparks left the training center in April of 1971, Young also had set out on his own and pursued a job outside of the center. He lied his way into working in a photography supply store called Hadlands and returned to purchasing large amounts of antimony from chemist shops by forging the required documentation to purchase Schedule I poisons and signing the register once again as M. E. Evans. He also broke two of the conditions of his release once he left the training center. He stopped seeing his psychologist and he stopped adhering to the terms of his probation. The police didn't even know of his whereabouts once he left the training center. Mm. His new colleagues at the photography shop also had no idea who he was, but I will say this. These people and the people at the training center had to have known this guy was flaming fucking human garbage. He openly talked about Hitler and the Nazis and the way that Britain was failing to do things in the 1970s. And he also had his preoccupation with poisons, which again, like, fine, whatever. But when you pair it with the Nazis, it's like, right. I don't know. Not a good combo. Yeah. Not a good combo. And it seems like everyone just let it slide. And like, I don't know if there's something cultural I'm missing, but it's like, I don't know. I can't. I can't imagine that this is anything except him getting away with shit because he was a young white guy who came off as educated. Like, right. hold these fucking dudes accountable. And, like, I don't want to victim blame because a lot of these people ended up getting poisoned. But, like, maybe you could have seen some of this coming if you hadn't just let Nazi apologism slide. Like, right. Right. I don't know. So the first person to take ill in this shop was 59-year-old Bob Eggle, the storeroom boss, who went home early on Thursday, June 3rd with diarrhea that lasted throughout the weekend. The day after Eggle returned, the store's driver, Ron Hewitt, became sick with diarrhea and a stomach ache that turned into vomiting and a burning sensation in his throat that lasted two days. Hewitt went to the hospital on the second day and was diagnosed with food poisoning, but instead of getting better over the next few days, as would be expected with food poisoning, Hewitt became worse. The vomiting and diarrhea didn't let up, the burning sensation got worse, and nothing he was giving seemed to make any difference. After a week, he was feeling well enough to return to work, but was totally worn out from having been so ill. 
Over the next three weeks, he would become acutely symptomatic in this way another 12 times. <sighs> I know. Jesus. Egil himself still wasn't quite feeling well at the end of the month and decided to take a seaside vacation with his wife. And it was while Egil was away on this vacation that Young again turned to a greater poison. The Friday before Egil returned to work, Young purchased 25 grams of thallium from a pharmacist. That's enough to do a lot of killing. Yeah, yeah. The day after Egil returned, he became so sick after tea time that he had to leave the shop. He'd completely lost feeling in the tips of his fingers. He couldn't eat dinner and couldn't even take a walk that evening when his wife suggested that the fresh air might do him some good, as it had done when they were at the seaside. Instead, she put him to bed and they both hoped he would sleep off whatever it was he was coming down with. The feeling still hadn't returned to his fingers, and he was staggering like a drunk, so his wife had to undress him and then help him into his pajamas. Once Uggle was down, though, he couldn't sleep. His back ached, and even the weight of his blankets on his body caused him unbearable pain. At 6 a.m., he tried to get out of bed and realized he couldn't stand now, so a doctor was brought into the home. Egil was diagnosed with peripheral neuritis and was immediately rushed to the hospital. The next day, he was transferred to the ICU and his condition worsened. When he was first admitted, he was thrashing from side to side because the pain he felt in his entire body was so bad. But now that he was in the ICU, he was completely paralyzed. Mm. There was a sign posted over his bed stating that he could hear what he was being told but could not reply. His heart stopped beating twice, but medical staff was able to revive him. Unfortunately, on July 7th, after eight days of excruciating pain, Bob Eggle died. An autopsy was performed two days later, and Eggle's death was attributed to bronchopneumonia caused by Gillian Barre polyneuritis. No cause could be found for the paralysis, but an inquest was not called for further investigation, and Eggle's body was cremated. After that, things calmed down a bit at Hadlands. Ron Hewitt had quit working there the same day that Eggle's autopsy was performed, and Eggle's position had been passed to the next person who worked the closest with him and knew his job the best, and that was Graham Young. Mmm, bet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the next couple of months may have been less eventful, not because of this succession, though, but because this is when Young took his vacation. Oh, nice. <laughs> When he returned, no one was sick immediately, but they did take notice to the fact that all Young seemed to talk about was Eggle's death. He was concerned about Eggle's health when he was in the hospital, and was fairly animated when talking about it immediately following the news of his passing. But after two months, no one else wanted to talk about it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Seriously? <laughs> like, why are we still talking about this? Yeah, and he just wouldn't let it go. He he was telling his family about the sicknesses at work, and he was telling his family about Eggle's death, and you'd think that they definitely would have done something about it, since it was so obvious that he was, like, kind of obsessed with something that was, mm -hmm. like, reminiscent of past interests and behaviors. But they didn't, and I don't know. I guess I don't blame them, but it's also like, I, I don't know, this... This isn't good. Like, you didn't yeah. <laughs> You didn't want Graham to ever get out of Broadmoor, and now people are dying around him. Like, Maybe, to... yeah. <laughs> Can somebody raise the, the red flag a little? Just, just a little bit. Just a little bit? Like many of the stories we tell, there was a couple of points at which somebody could have intervened. But they didn't. <laughs> Of course they didn't. Of even course even they didn't, though we're here was, talking about this, <laughs> right? And this is even though there was like also obvious bumbling. Like it wasn't just like, I guess it was all circumstantial, but there was a lot that like pointed to this being young. Like around the same time, there was a coworker at Hadland named Fred Biggs who was a gardener, and he was complaining about some of the insects that were eating his flowers. So Young suggested that Biggs use nicotine as an insect repellent, and even went so far as to buy nicotine for Biggs to use. But Biggs didn't want it, and I guess I wouldn't either. Like, if somebody came to me and was like, I bought this nicotine for you, I'd be like, thanks? That's a little hardcore, since I was just, like, right. casually complaining about this. 
<laughs> but thank then, you for taking such an interest in my flowers. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> he then suggested to Biggs that he use thallium, and this time Biggs didn't argue. Young gave him 15 grams of thallium and told him to never handle it without gloves on. But then the subject just never came up again. Like, I don't know if he, like, didn't check in or if Biggs maybe avoided him. Like, I don't know what Biggs knew about thallium, but this is just such a fucking weird interaction. Like, here, right. have a huge amount of thallium for your garden. <laughs> right. What the fuck is that? I just happen to have this lying around. Here you go. Like, right. what the fuck? Right. And it was used as a like a rat poison then, but it was, like, sure. strictly controlled by this point. So, I don't know. In September, Fred Biggs suddenly became ill with stomach pains and vomiting. He improved over the weekend, and the following Monday, another Hadlands worker named Peter Buck became sick with the same symptoms after having tea. The next day, Buck was feeling well enough to come back to work and told Young, who he'd shared tea with the day before, that it was the tea that made him sick. He knew, and he knew because it was the only thing he'd had to eat or drink that day, so there was it couldn't be anything else. Mm -hmm. but, but there was no way for him to suspect that it was Young who would he poison just, the tea. He yeah. just thought it was the tea. Yeah, he just thought it was the tea, and it's probably like, hey, did you feel okay after tea yesterday? Because... That's what made me, like, really mm. ill. Three weeks later, on October 8th, a man named David Tilson became nauseated after tea at work, but was otherwise okay. The next day was a Saturday, so he didn't have tea. I mean, maybe he did at home, but he didn't have Hadlin's tea. But he started to experience pins and needles in his feet that wouldn't go away. By Sunday, the numbness had ascended his legs. He saw a doctor who recommended rest. Tilson was able to return to work that Tuesday, but he still felt stiffness in his legs. Shortly after this, Young stayed late at Hadlands with a co-worker named Jethro Bat, whom he told plainly, It is quite easy to poison someone and make it look like natural causes. And then he described a series of ways that you could administer poison this way. <laughs> Without giving it much thought, Bat then accepted some coffee Young had made uh. <laughs> while Bat was taking a bathroom break. The coffee was dark and bitter, and since Bat was particular about his coffee, he only drank a little bit and then poured the rest out because it wasn't to his taste. Young then asked, what's the matter? Do you think I'm trying to poison you? Oh my god. <laughs> and both men laughed because obviously in real life you never consider that your weird fucking co-worker is actually trying to poison you yeah jesus <laughs> but that's hilarious despite how little bat drank 20 minutes later he was back in the bathroom violently ill he had to go home after that and since it was late he gave young a ride as well over the weekend, Bat also felt pain in his legs that eventually gave way to numbness while the pains moved up to his stomach. The following Monday, October 18th, Tilson and Bat both visited the doctor. Tilson had chest and stomach pain and couldn't breathe. He still had the feeling of pins and needles in his feet and the joints in his lower body were stiff. Bat, meanwhile, had horrible pain in his legs. Tilson was given medication, which did nothing for him, and the next day he felt worse. Much like Eggle, the weight of his pajamas on his body caused him unbearable pain. Tilson was admitted to the hospital and felt better after some bouts of vomiting, but then his hair began to fall out. While Tilson was being admitted to the hospital, Bat was laid up at home in bed with pains in his chest and stomach, and Graham Young was having coffee with a co-worker named Diana Smart. She became ill got a stomach ache, and felt pens and needles in her legs and had to go home early. Bat's condition continued to unknowingly match Tilson's symptoms just a day delayed. On Wednesday, his hair was beginning to fall out. He was hallucinating and was in such awful pain that he told his wife he wanted to kill himself. The next day, October 21st, he wasn't able to get out of bed and his toes were completely rigid. His doctor placed him on bed rest, and he wasn't admitted to the hospital, despite his worsening condition, until November 5th. By then, he was completely bald and actively suicidal. Tilson was released from the hospital on October 28th. 
not because he was better, but because he'd stopped getting worse, and the cause of his condition had not been discovered. Doctors were beginning to suspect that this was just all in his head, despite, Ugh. like, his hair falling out and shit. Right, like, yeah, he's imagining that. Mm-hmm. When he returned home, however, his attempts to return back to life made him even worse. Merely trying to walk around his own house made his heart rate skyrocket, and his hair was coming out in chunks. Four days after he was discharged, he was readmitted to the same hospital. Back at Hadlands, the only remaining full-time worker was Graham Young. <laughs> and so the store found itself desperately short-staffed for the stock-taking weekend ahead of the holiday season. Fred Biggs was still on and off work with sporadic bouts of violent illness, but he and his wife both came in to help. Young thanked them by making them tea in the morning and afternoon on Saturday, and everyone was working so hard that they got the work done early. The Biggses went out on Saturday night, but on Sunday, Fred felt even worse than before. Monday, he visited his doctor, but was too ill to go to work, and on Tuesday, he was experiencing chest pains and difficulty walking. He had pins and needles in his feet, his pajamas hurt to wear. On Thursday, November 4th, he was admitted to the hospital. Biggs and Bat were in the same hospital, and Tilson was in the same osp- hospital, where Eggle had died months before, and so there weren't defined patterns in patient presentation for the big area hospitals to notice mm-hmm. what was happening. Mm-hmm. But the other workers at Hadlands, including the managing director, could see that something was going on. There were two main rumors circulating at the store. The first was that the water at the store was contaminated, and that's why people were getting sick after drinking tea or coffee. And the second was that the workers were being exposed to radioactive materials from the airfield that was located near the store. Oh, no. I know. (laughs) Diana Smart personally believed that Graham Young, the sole storeroom worker remaining at Hadlands, must have himself some sort of infectious disease to which he was immune, but which he was infecting people around him. Kind of a typhoid Mary situation. Oh my god, the irony of that, though. Like, (laughs) she's so, like, you're so close, (laughs) but also so far away. (laughs) After Young heard what Smart was saying about him, she suddenly came down with the bed of the illness and had to go home. Of course she did. (laughs) Fred Biggs was transferred to a specialist in London, but his condition only worsened. He became weak, completely paralyzed, and unable to speak, but was still conscious and likely aware of the intense swelling and peeling of the skin on his face and scrotum. Management at Hadlands brought in a doctor to get to the bottom of the epidemic and to quell some of the fears that were rising. They had investigated all possible leads and determined that there was no cause for disease and infection and no need to be concerned for the health of employees when Fred Biggs died on November 19th. Things at the store became tense, with people concerned about biblical plagues and evil spirits. Some people were considering quitting and, like, I don't know, I probably would, like, if everyone was dying around Everybody, me. Right. <laughs> Another doctor was brought in to an all-hands meeting at Hadlands, a GP named Dr. Ian Anderson, and he suggested three possible explanations for the sicknesses and the now multiple deaths. Radiation poisoning, heavy metal poisoning, or a virus. He explained to everyone at Hadlands that the first two had been rolled out and that thallium specifically had been eliminated because as a manufacturer of high refractive lenses, it was an industry standard at stores like Hadlands to use thallium. However, extremely ironically, Hadlands had never used thallium on their premises. Oh. It was determined, therefore, that it must be a virus, and likely oh this, <laughs> the same one which had been making its way through the local community and had been nicknamed the Bovingdon Bug. It had struck a number of Hadlands workers quite viciously, but there was nothing to be alarmed about. Except for the people dying and violently ill. Yeah. My guy. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe don't exclude thallium just because we don't use it. If you think a heavy metal is suspended. yeah, ser- <laughs> seriously. But during this meeting, someone at the back of the room 
they also loudly refuse to believe that, just as you and I refuse to believe that. Specifically, they refused to believe that heavy metals could safely be ruled out as the culprit, and they started to aggressively question the doctor about the symptoms that the severely sickened employees had, and the symptoms that the now dead employees had, and why were they so sure that these symptoms were just in the heads of those people? And that employee who was doing that questioning was Graham Young. Of course it was. <laughs> oh my god. He can't. Bastard. I know. <laughs> like, other people bumble because it's obvious that they're doing it. And at times it is obvious that he's doing it. I mean, he's the only one left. Like, that's bumbling. Right. But, like, part of his bumbling is just, like, maybe you could have gotten away with it if you would have shut the fuck up. Yeah, like, rule number one, shut the fuck up. He doesn't follow it. He's like, no, I'm going to point the finger at myself. <laughs> Like, nobody's figuring it out, but I'm going to go, hey, no, 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 wait, I did it. Are you also dumb that me. you can't see it? It was me. It was me. <laughs> it was me the whole time. But so this line of questioning, like, it upset people. <laughs> it upset the store owner. It upset this doctor. The meeting was ended, and they pulled Young aside to be like, hey, why are you asking questions like this? And <laughs> it roused their suspicions. So they called... Finally. <laughs> I, know. I know. So they called their lawyers and the police, and they started to kind of re-examine the timeline of events, like, with a more of a focus on Young and his possible involvement. And Scotland Yard was asked to check their records, but they came up with nothing for a Graham Frederick Young. But Hadlin's had Young's original application materials, including a letter of recommendation from his psychiatrist at Broadmoor. Like, he didn't lie about having been in Broadmoor. There was no way about him getting around that. But when he applied, he had told them that he had been in Broadmoor because his mother had died in a car accident and he'd, like, had a mental breakdown. And oh, so they, very different reason. Yeah, and so they called Broadmoor, and they were like, hey, what's up with this Graham Young guy? And Dr. Odwin was like, oh, yeah, he was here for poisoning his family, but he's better now. <laughs> they were like, he was in there for what? <laughs> so after all of this, Young was found at his aunt's house and was arrested for suspected murder. Fred Young claimed that as his son was placed into the squad car, he overheard him ask, which one are you doing me for? <laughs> At the police station, a vial was found on Young's person, which he described as his exit dose of over two grams of thallium, which he was unable to take because he wasn't expecting to be arrested when he was. Mm. After his arrest, a preliminary search was made of his flat. Officers found all of Young's Nazi paraphernalia, dozens of bottles, vials, and tubes of substances, and all of his edgelord drawings of graveyards and people dying and men with their hair falling out. <laughs> Young had dozens of empty wine and ether bottles, and the ether he admitted to huffing but said that he wasn't addicted because it wasn't addictive. But <laughs> that is also not true. <laughs> okay, I was just about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The most important item they found, however, was Young's diary, which detailed the poisonings of the Hadlands workers <sighs> and their physical states afterwards. Well, gosh darn it, he made it easy at least. <laughs> but I mean, and easy now that they finally put the pieces together. Fucking right? Yeah. Like, it took long enough, but at least now they've got him, like, guilty as charged. The police were keeping quiet to Young about what they knew, and he could not stand it <laughs> he of course wanted, he couldn't he no. he has to know everything about everything like. yeah and he wanted to know what they knew about him he wanted to know what they discovered and he wanted to show off about what it was that they didn't know so he could rub it in their face that they hadn't figured it out Ugh. and so because of this he ended up giving a full confession and not just about these 1971 poisonings he confessed to killing his stepmother in 1962 and bragged about how it had been declared a natural death and she'd been cremated without anyone suspecting anything. Oh, my God. Yeah. But what the police wanted at this point was a confession to the poisonings for which two men, Tilson and Bat, were still suffering, like 
help can still be gotten for this guy's charges mm-hmm. can still be pressed. They told Young that, you know, Tilson and Bat were getting worse and asked if he was concerned about that. And he took the opportunity to show off and was like, well, if they're getting worse, it means that they're not being given the proper medical treatment because there is an antidote for what's happening to them. And so he told them that the antidote was dimercaprol and potassium chloride. And he admitted to poisoning the two men from Hadlands who were still hospitalized, but he wouldn't say what he poisoned them with or any further details. Ugh. And I mean, they they know. They knew at this point. Like, they, they know what knew. it is. Yeah. But they also, like, people aren't so dumb that you can't, like, give a doctor an antidote and they're not going to be like, oh, okay. Like, that's what this is an antidote for, whatever. But, like, the police needed the verbal statement. They needed the verbal confession. And Young's diary described poisoning eight people who were identified only by their initials. So investigators recognized the initials for six people because they matched the names of the people from Hadlands, but they were having a difficult time with two others. And when Young was asked about them, he had admitted poisoning two people. But then, at this point, he tells the officers that everything written in the diary was notes to himself for a novel he was writing. And oh, my God. Everything in this diary is a complete work of fiction. Even okay. the information on the two people I already admitted to poisoning. But whatever. <laughs> but whatever. Ugh. After just a few hours... Young could not help himself from reveling in the puzzle he had created for the police and from watching them unravel it. So he admitted that the people in his notebook were friends from work and that he had poisoned them, and even went so far as to admit to the poisonings of Trevor Sparks and Peter Biggs. He poisoned different people with different poisons, depending on how intensely he wanted his victims to suffer. So, for instance, Trevor Sparks, Diana Smart, and Peter Buck— and then another employee named Mary Barrows were only ever poisoned with antimony because it is less toxic and leaves the system more quickly than thallium. Young admitted to giving Bob Eggle and Fred Biggs two doses of 600 milligrams of thallium each. Holy shit. And he gave David Tilson around between 325 to 390 milligrams of thallium. And then Jethro Bat received the smallest amount, but still, like, could have been fatal at 260 mm-hmm. milligrams. Wow. An autopsy was performed on Fred Biggs's body, and ample evidence of thallium poisoning was present in the corpse, but there was no trace of the metal itself in his blood or urine, which makes sense, since Fred had been continuously sick in and out of the hospital for 20 days. Tissue analyses were performed on Biggs's kidneys, muscles, brain, and bones, and measurable amounts of thallium ranging from 5 to 120 parts per million were detected. On November 23rd, Young was then charged with the murder of Fred Biggs. Bob Eggle's body, however, had been cremated, but his ashes had not been scattered, and so they were collected for analysis. Detectable Mm. amounts of thallium were found and were comparable to the amounts of thallium found in the bones of Fred Biggs. That's interesting that they were able to test the cremains. Yeah. Yeah, because not everything can be done like Mm -mm. that. No, that's really really cool. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In early December, Young was charged with the murder of Bob Eggle, and this actually was the first time in history that a murder charge had been pressed using the analysis of cremains. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So it was the first, and it was kind of one of the last. Mm. Another set of cremains was analyzed to ensure that thallium was not a normal contaminant in cremains, like how mercury is. Mm -hmm. But there are shortcomings to using cremains in this way. It's not like analyzing blood. It's not even like analyzing decomposing tissue because everything is more difficult with, you know, like organic stuff, obviously. And like they're impacted by pH and so they can undergo chemical change. They can kind of move around in the body. Like if you have a substance in your stomach and then you die and the pH changes, it can actually like travel outside of your stomach to a degree depending on what it is. And so there will be less in your stomach and then more outside of your body. And then what do you do with that? But with metals, it's a little bit different. And so that's why they were able to do it for thallium. Gotcha. But 
still there's the chance of like cross contamination from cremains. And so if somebody else was cremated in the incinerator first and there was something left over, well, how do you know the mm. value is not from that? God. Oh. Right. But with Bob Eggle, part of his kidney was still at the hospital after his autopsy. And so they were able to compare his kidney sample to his cremains. But that's it's still comparing like bones to kidneys. So it's not one to one. So gotcha. This is historic, but it's also not done like almost ever. <laughs> <laughs> So Young was charged with causing bodily harm through administration of poisons to four other persons. Young pled not guilty to the charges in March, but no one wanted to represent him, and so the trial had to be postponed twice for him to gain re representation. Oh, wow. Yeah. On July 19th, 1972, Graham Young was finally put on trial for 10 charges of murder, attempted murder, and causing grievous bodily harm. He maintained that the entries in the diary were a work of fiction, and the confession he had given was fake. He was arrogant and unemotional on the stand and challenged questioning, which is, like, fine to do, whatever, like, defend yourself, but it didn't endear him to his jury. Like, they could just see you're an arrogant... Straight through it. Yeah. yeah. He was himself on the stand, except that he lacked any admission that he wanted to kill people and didn't care how much they suffered while he did it. Like, mm. that's the only part of himself that he was like, maybe I won't show you that. <laughs> right. At Young's trial, the now former soccer player Trevor Sparks was still experiencing pain from the poisonings, despite uh. having had no contact with Young for over a year. Young, however, was acquitted of poisoning Sparks and Buck but was found guilty of poisoning Hewitt and Smart, as well as the attempted murder of Tilson and Bat, and was found guilty of the murders of Eggle and Biggs. For these crimes, Graham Young was sentenced to life. He himself requested that he would rather serve his sentence in prison rather than at Broadmoor again, and was granted this request and sent to a maximum security facility on the Isle of Wight. There he remained until his death from a heart attack on August 1st, 1990, Two weeks short of his 43rd birthday. Wow. He got away with a lot. He really did. He yeah. He really did. Yeah. And I just, I still think it's just because he seemed like an educated white guy. And mm -hmm. like, I think we do know better now, but let's not let that shit slide. Yeah. Educated white guys, in my experience, are some of the worst people I've encountered. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this well, and especially the, the it's the arrogance for me. It's yeah. the arrogance and so the arrogant. like. Yeah, it's too much. It's yeah. too much. Wow, he he really did a number. He really he, did. Yeah. yeah, and he got out so early compared, like, because they said he was supposed to be sentenced till he was twenty nine. Yeah, he, he got totally twenty three. Mm hmm. That's yeah. crazy. How many lives would have been spared had he served his whole sentence? At least two. <laughs> <laughs> like, at least. But he, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I thought we needed a little bit of shift away from the systemic poisoning. <laughs> no, this was a good one. This was interesting. This was interesting. It was, it was, it was definitely a nice uh, reprieve from the systemic stuff we've been going through. So thank well, you for this one. Well, you just wait until the next story because it's a single person who's poisoned, but there's systemic faults to talk about. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Let's go. Let's go. Thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this episode. Please like, follow, subscribe, and review us everywhere you get your podcasts. For more Lethal Dose content, you can find us at Lethal Dose Pod on Instagram, Tumblr, and TikTok. For an overdose of content, subscribe on Patreon for exclusive episodes and much more. The show theme is Look Far by our dear wizard friend Fogweaver. More of their music can be found on bandcamp.com. Lethal Dose is created, researched, produced, and edited by Kayla Woods and Venus Dineko. Stay safe and remember, the dose makes the poison. <laughs>